Eusebius of Caesarea, 260 to 341 AD, or Eusebius Pamphili was Bishop of Caesarea in Palestine. He is considered the father of church history and was a Christian scholar and presbyter in the church at Caesarea. His major work was his History of the Church, a massive piece of research that preserves quotations from many older writers that would otherwise have been lost, specifically, for researchers of Phoenician history. In the extracts from his book Preparatio Evangelica, Preparation for the Gospel, from a translation by E. H. Gifford in 1903, a considerable gist of Phoenician theology was made available. In fact, Phoenician history contained in his book is the oldest non-coded document of the Western world's historical archives. Furthermore, it is particularly valuable because its author, Sancuniathan, was a free man who did not hesitate to denounce myths. Phoenician history is a fundamental document of human culture, and the surviving fragments of it were almost lost had it not been for Eusebius. For important icons of knowledge need to be made known to the average reader of history who may not be familiar with them. They are Sancuniathan of Berytus, Tautos of Byblos, Philo of Biblius and Porphyry of Tyre, Sancuniathan of Berytus, Beirut, or Sakanyathan in Phoenician means. The god Sakan has given. He was an ancient Phoenician sage, priest, and writer. He lived before the Trojan times. Judging from the fragments of the Phoenician history, Sancuniathan appears to have been a contemporary of Semiramis, the queen of Assyria, the wife of Ninus, with whom she founded Nineveh 2000 BC. However, some believe that Sancuniathan was a contemporary of Gideon 1339 BC without any proof. His book goes back into fabled antiquity. Sancuniathan, like Vgasa in India, is said to have been a compiler of extremely ancient theogonic and historical documents that had been transmitted to him either by oral tradition or in writing. Sancuniathan derived the sacred lore from the mystic inscriptions on the Hamanim, sun pillars, which stood in Phoenician temples. Porphyry of Tyre says that Sancuniathan wrote a history of the Jews based on information derived from Hierambal, i.e. Jerubal, a priest of the god Jivo, i.e. Yeve. He dedicated it to Abel Baal or Ababal, king of Berytus. The story was thought to be fictional because of its reference to Berytus. However, excavations in Berytus in recent years prove that the city may be older than Byblos that has cultural tradition to 8000 BC. Sancuniathan's Phoenician history may be regarded as one of the most authentic memorials of the events which took place before the flood. It begins with a legendary cosmogony and relates to how the first two mortals were begotten by the wind spirit and his wife Bo Darkness. It refers to the fall, the production of fire, the invention of huts and clothing, the origin of the arts of agriculture, hunting, fishing and navigation, and the beginnings of human civilization. Sancuniathan gives a curious account of the descendants of the line of Cain. His history of the descendants of the line of Seth reads like the record in Genesis. Philo of Biblius, Byblos, or Herennios Philon of Byblos, 64 to 141 AD, was a Phoenician scholar and Roman citizen, born in Byblos, and representative of the Roman consul Herennius Severus. He wrote numerous works of grammatical, lexical, encyclopedic, and historical importance. He wrote in Greek about scientific authors and famous people and their work, especially Emperor Hadrian. His most important work is the translation of Phoenician history by Sancuniathan. This work was thought to be made up but since 1929 archaeological evidence from Ras Shamra, Ugarit, of clay tablets texts dated to 1400 to 1200 BC proved him true. He had a considerable reputation for honesty in his work which archaeology confirmed. His Greek translation represents a valuable source for our knowledge of the Phoenician Canaanite religion. According to Philo, the names of Mount Lebanon, the mountain range of the Anti-Lebanon, and other Syrian mountains were derived from the names of giants who once dwelt there. In ancient history, most high mountains were thought of as the abode of gods. In the case of Mount Lebanon, it would have been Baal Lebanon, sometimes identified as Baal Hadad. Porphyry Malchus of Tyre, 223 to 309 AD, was born in Tyre and studied in Athens, 
before joining the Neoplatonic group of Plotinus in Rome where he studied philosophy. Porphyry was a man of great learning and was interested in, and had great talent for historical and philological criticism. He had a passion to uproot false teachings in order to ennoble people and turn them to the good. He declared the salvation of the soul as the ultimate purpose of philosophy. His works include Against the Christians, a work of 15 volumes directed not against Christ or his teachings, but against the Christians of his own day and their sacred books. He argued they were the work of ignorant people and deceivers. He attacked Christian doctrines on both philosophical and exegetically grounds. As to be expected, his books were banned in 448 and ordered destroyed by the Christians. Copious extracts of them remain in the writings of St. Augustine and others. Other books such as Aids to the Study of the Intelligibles is a basic summary of Neoplatonism. He wrote against Moses and attacked Eusebius of Caesarea. He lived an austere celibate life. Porphyry believed that animals, unlike plants, although having somewhat less rational souls than humans, nevertheless still had souls. He believed that they were capable of recognizing and assessing their situation, making future plans and in a sense communicating and responding to one another and to humans. Tartos of Byblos or Thoth came from Byblos, Phoenicia, CA 2000 BC. According to the Egyptians, language is attributed to Tartos who was the father of tautology, or imitation. He invented the first written characters 2000 years BC or earlier. He played his flute to the chief deity of Byblos, the moon goddess Baal at Nikol. Tartos was called Thoth by the Greeks and Jehudi by the Egyptians. The mythology of Tartos is echoed in the god Dionysus, or in Jorth the snake priest who was the consort to the moon goddess. The snake priest was also represented by the symbol of a pillar, a wand or a caduceus. The Greeks equated Thoth with the widely traveled Hermes. According to Egyptian tradition, Osiris traveled the world with Thoth. Asclepios, alternatively known as Eshman, is responsible for carrying on the teachings of Tartos on snake priesthood. Under the protective umbrella of Hindu culture, snake charmers playing their nasal punji echo the same tradition. In the early ages of Christianity, some monks, such as Pacomius, was a Serapic priest before he became a Christian. Similarly, Ormus is said to have been a seraphic priest before being converted by Saint Mark. Some believe that he fused those mysteries with Christianity and establishing a school of Solomonic wisdom. It is reported then that Phoenicians and Egyptians were the first of all mankind to declare the sun and moon and stars to be gods and to be the sole causes of both the generation and decay of the universe and that they afterwards introduced into common life the deifications and theogonies which are matters of general notoriety. Before these, it is said, no one made any progress in the knowledge of the celestial phenomena, except the few men mentioned among the Hebrews, who with clearest mental eyes looked beyond all the visible world, and worshipped the maker and creator of the universe, marveling much at the greatness of his wisdom and power, which they represented to themselves from his works and being persuaded that he alone was God. They naturally spake only of him as God, son from father successively receiving, and guarding this as the true, the first, and the only religion. The rest of mankind, however, having fallen away from this only true religion, and gazing in awe upon the luminaries of heaven with eyes of flesh, as mere children in mind, proclaimed them gods, and honored them with sacrifices and acts of worship, though as yet they built no temples, nor formed likenesses of mortal men with statues and carved images, but looked up to the clear sky and to heaven itself, and in their souls reached up unto the things there seen. Not here, however, did polytheistic error stay its course for men of later generations, but driving on into an abyss of evils wrought even greater impiety than the denial of God, the Phoenicians, and then the Egyptians being the first authors of the delusion. For from them, it is said, Orpheus, son of Eagris, first brought over with him the mysteries of the Egyptians, and imparted them to the Greeks, just, in fact, as Cadmus brought to them the Phoenician mysteries together with the knowledge of letters, for the Greeks up to that time did not yet know the use of the alphabet. 
First, therefore, let us inquire how those of whom we are speaking have judged concerning the first creation of the world. Then consider their opinions about the first and most ancient superstition found in human life. And thirdly, the opinions of the Phoenicians. Fourthly, those of the Egyptians. After which, fifthly, making a distinction in the opinions of the Greeks. We will first examine their ancient and more mythical delusion, and then their more serious and, as they say, more natural philosophy concerning the gods. And after this we will travel over the account of their admired oracles, after which we will also take a survey of the serious doctrines of the noble philosophy of the Greeks. So, when these have been thoroughly discussed, we will pass over to the doctrines of the Hebrews meaning of the original and true Hebrews, and of those who afterwards received the name Jews. And after all these we will add our own doctrines as if they were a seal set upon the whole. The history of all these we must necessarily recall, that so by comparison of the doctrines which have been admired in each country the test of the truth may be exhibited, and it may become manifest to our readers from what opinions we have departed, and what that truth is which we have chosen. But now let us pass to the first point. From what source then shall we verify our proofs? Not, of course, from our own scriptures, lest we should seem to show favor to our argument. But let Greeks themselves appear as our witnesses, both those of them who boast of their philosophy, and those who have investigated the history of other nations. Well then, in recording the ancient theology of the Egyptians from the beginning, Diodorus, the Sicilian, leads the way, a man thoroughly known to the most learned of the Greeks as having collected the whole library of history into one treatise. From him I will set forth first what he has clearly stated in the beginning of his work concerning the origin of the whole world, while recording the opinion of the ancients in the manner following. The ancients worshipped no other gods than the celestial luminaries, knowing nothing of the god of the universe, nor even of the erection of carved images, nor of demons. It is said then that the men who dwelled of old in Egypt when they looked up to the cosmos, and were struck with astonishment and admiration at the nature of the universe, Suppose that the sun and moon were two eternal and primal gods, one of whom they named Osiris, and the other Isis, each name being applied from some true etymology. For when they are translated into the Greek form of speech, Osiris is many-eyed, with reason, for casting his beams in every direction he beholds, as it were with many eyes, the whole earth and sea, and with this the poet's words agree. Thou sun, who all things sayest, and nearest all, but some of the ancient mythologists among the Greeks gave to Osiris the additional name Dionysus, and by a slight change in the name, Sirius. One of these, Eumolpus, speaks in his back sheet poems thus. Dionysus named, bright as a star, his face aflame with rays. And Orpheus says, for that same cause fans and Dionysus him they call. Some say also that the fawn skin cloak is hung about him as a representation of the spangling of the stars. Isis too, being interpreted, means ancient, the name having been given to the moon from her ancient and eternal origin. And they put horns upon her, both from the aspect with which she appears whenever she is crescent-shaped, and also from the cow which is consecrated to her among the Egyptians. And these deities are supposed to regulate the whole world. Such then are the statements on this subject. You find, too, in the Phoenician theology, that their first physical philosophers knew no other gods than the sun, the moon, and besides these the planets, the elements also, and the things connected with them, and that to these the earliest of mankind consecrated the productions of the earth, and regarded them as gods, and worshipped them as the sources of sustenance to themselves and to following generations, and to all that went before them, and offered to them drink offerings and libations. But pity and lamentation and weeping they consecrated to the produce of the earth when perishing, and to the generation of living creatures at first from the earth, and then to their production one from another, and to their end. When they departed from life. These notions of worship were in accordance with their own weakness, and the want as yet of any enterprise of mind. Such are the statements of the Phoenician writings as will be proved in due course.